said in your word, where we gather together in your name, in your character, in your authority, that you're in the midst of us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, you're our teacher, that you're the one who lifts the veil off of our eyes and gives us the revelation of your word, the revelation of your truth, that you speak to us and you reveal your character, your nature, your will, and your purposes to us. I thank you, Lord, that the word is incorruptible seed. That today, incorruptible seed will be engrafted upon our hearts and our minds in good ground, in good soil that has been already prepared by your presence here today. I thank you now that even a great harvest comes forth from this word. In the matchless name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you love the Lord? Amen. How many of you love his word? Hallelujah. Today we're going to go into a teaching that is somewhat of a review, if I, if I can call it anything. Say review. review. I've been hammering down some themes for the last two, three years, almost every Sunday. And so there's like a combination of things in today's teaching that are going to sound very familiar if you've been attending. If you're visiting with us this morning, thank you for being here. If you're fairly new, Thank you again. You'll learn something, all right? But some of us have heard this already. Not the teaching, but some of the things in the teaching. So, I am going to read to you the entire chapter of 2 Corinthians 5. Is that all right? It's 21 verses. Can you deal with it? You can handle it? It's the Bible. You should be able to handle it. Amen. Let me just grab my water. I'm stepping out of frame for a second. I'm right here. I didn't go nowhere. He's excited about the word. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 1 in the voice translation. How many of you are familiar with the voice? The voice translation is something I kind of refer to once in a while. I don't use it or recommend it as a standalone translation but just to enhance your version that you already use, sometimes you get a little bit of an insight to things. Ready? This is how it starts. It starts with a footnote. It says, in chapter 3, Paul explains how the Spirit transforms believers so they are conformed to the image of Jesus. Isn't that good? The Spirit of God through the Word transforms us that we begin to act like, look like, talk like, behave like Jesus did. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, you look like Jesus. You should look like Jesus. And if you don't look like him in features, you're wearing his armor. He now clarifies that this change means believers embody Jesus' death through suffering and participate in his present risen life. This life is ultimately experienced through the resurrection of the body in the future. But it also consists of an inward renewal in the midst of the challenges and troubles of daily experiences. How many have some daily troubles and experiences? Our hope is, therefore, not a release from our bodies, right? We're not saying, man, I, can't, I hope the rapture comes tonight just so we get out of this mess, right? We're not hoping for this resurrection just to get out of here. Our hope is, therefore, not in a release from our bodies, but a resurrection of our bodies so that the life inside of us now will begin to show outward, outside as well. While we still suffer, this hope of bodily resurrection is a matter of our faith. Verse 1. You ready? We know that, we, that if our earthly house, how many know what your earthly house is? What you live in. A mere tent that can easily be taken down is destroyed. We will then live in the eternal home in the heavens, a building crafted by divine, not human hands. Currently, in this tent of a house, we continue to groan and ache with a deep desire to be sheltered in our permanent home. Right? How many of you long to be in heaven? Right? But heaven dwells in you, so the kingdom is in you in a sense here. Right? Deep desire to be sheltered in our permanent home because then... We will be truly clothed and comfortable, comfortably protected by a covering for our current nakedness. The fact is that in this tent, we anxiously moan, fearing the naked truth of our reality. 
What we crave above all is to be clothed so that what is temporary and mortal can be wrapped completely in his life. Amen. The one who has worked and tailored us for this is God himself, who has gifted his spirit to us as a pledge towards our permanent home. Verse 6. In light of this, we live with a daring passion. Say daring passion. We live with this zeal. We live with the overtop enthusiasm for God. Amen? Turn to David says, sounds like you. We live with this excitement about who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. In the light of this, we live with a daring passion and know that our time spent in this body is also time we are not present with the Lord. The path we walk is charted by faith, thank God, not by what we see with our eyes, right? We walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 8, there is no doubt that we live with a daring passion. You see, to truly walk in faith, you need to walk in the zeal of God. Because if you're not passionate about God's word and you're not passionate about what he says and if you're not passionate about his promises, all you're going to see is yourself and your mess. Turn to your neighbor and say, do you have a mess? Right? When you're down, when you're discouraged, when you're defeated, all you see is your mess. You see the four walls of your what might be miserable existence. Amen? Thank God none of you are miserable, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 9. Ultimately, it does not matter whether we're here or gone because our purpose stays fixed. How many of you have a purpose? What is your purpose? Some people don't have a purpose in God. Some people don't know why God saved them. Some people don't know why they exist. All they know is they're supposed to come to church and they're supposed to read their Bibles and they're supposed to pray and occasionally fast and praise and worship. But they don't know the purpose. Say purpose. purpose. Not porpoise, purpose. Right? There's a purpose that God has called us. Each and every one of us have been gifted with gifts and talents. Each and every one of us have different personality giftings. Each and every one of us have different callings in Christ. But yet we're all called. Amen? We need to find out the purpose that God laid hold of us. Just like Paul said. What is it? Why did you lay hold of me? Why is it that you called me out of darkness into light? Why is it that you've named me your child? What is the purpose? The purpose is not heaven. That's a benefit. The purpose is not to get healed. That's a benefit. The purpose is not the deliverance from drugs, alcohol, mental illness. Benefit. What is the purpose that God called you? If you don't know your purpose, you need to do two things. You need to spend more time in prayer and the word, and you need to get close to your pastors. Don't cry. It's not that rough. <laughs> Amen? So what is the purpose? Ultimately, it doesn't matter whether we're here or gone. Our purpose stays fixed. Say fixed unmovable right i've met people in the body of christ that every week they have a different purpose they have a different calling they belong to a different church every week sounds like confusion to me not god it says those who are planted say planted so those that are planted say planted planted and the house of god flourish not those that oh one day here one day there you know church hopper Church hopper, grasshopper. Ultimately, it doesn't matter whether we're here or gone. Our purpose stays fixed. And the purpose is to please Him. Now, the overall purpose of being called is to please God. Can you name some things that please God? The Bible says faith pleases God. Your faith pleases God. Not this thing of a belief you know, well, I have a faith, I'm a Baptist, I have a faith, I'm a Presbyterian. No, talking about the active living faith of God is what pleases him. Amen? Obedience pleases him. Because faith without works is not faith at all. Right, faith? Are you faith? Are you faith? 
You have faith? Good. <laughs> faith has faith. faith has faith. Hallelujah. Verse 10. In time, we will all stand in judgment before the throne of the anointed, the liberating king, to receive what is just for our conduct, whether it's good or bad, while we lived in this temporary body. Now, the Christian's judgment is not for condemnation or death. Just so you know, the sinner gets judged according to one thing and one thing only. And you know what that is? Whether their name is written in the book or not. That's it. As a matter of fact, because God doesn't expect you to do anything he doesn't do, everybody's name is already written in the book up until the time they die. And then, if you weren't born again, you weren't saved, you didn't have a relationship with God, the Bible says that name gets blotted out because God wills none to perish and all to come to everlasting life, right? So he gets up, he opens up the book. He says, oh yeah, I had faith that you're going to get saved. I knew, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, your name is not on the list. Devastating. You know there is a literal hell, right? Oh, Pastor Vin, you're not supposed to talk about hell. Why not? It's in the Bible. I read something quick this morning. I didn't read the whole story. I just read the headline of an article. And it said, church is supposed to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> because you are challenged. If you go to a church and you're comfortable and you're not challenged and you're not ministered the word of God to bring you to a higher level of perfection and walking in greater righteousness, greater holiness, all that great stuff, then you're just being ministered to your flesh and you're made to feel comfortable. Right? So sometimes it's good for us to squirm in our seats as long as I'm not condemning you. You know what I mean by condemning, right? You stupid jerks. Not going to do that. Right? The Holy Spirit, by the way, won't do that either. Amen? He would lovingly say, Oh, my child, why thou wouldst be so ignorant? <laughs> if your Holy Spirit speaks in King James. <laughs> Old King James. If it was the Holy Spirit speaking to you in 1613, maybe. Amen? <laughs> Shall we continue? Where did I leave off? Ah, yeah, verse 11. So because we stand in awe of the one true Lord, we make it our aim to convince all people of the truth of the gospel. We make it our aim to convince all people the truth of the gospel. We make it our aim to convince all people of the truth of the gospel. This is part of the purpose. This is part of the purpose that he's called us, that we purpose in our heart, we make it our aim, we make it our goal, we make it the reason that God called us out of darkness is that we can reach every single person with the gospel. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, every single person. Every single person. Every single person. Now, is it possible for one person in this room to reach every single person? Mathematically, probably not. Faithematically, possible. Because if one person can lead one to the Lord, who can lead ten to the Lord, who can lead a hundred to the Lord, who can lead a thousand to the Lord, who can lead a million to the Lord, why not? Why not? Why not? You know why? I'll tell you why. Because the body of Christ doesn't do what they're supposed to do. I know, I know. I feel the same way. Amen? And we come up with a million and one excuses why we can't do what God's called us to do. All I can do is minister to you and let the Holy Spirit do his job. Amen? We make it our aim to convince all people of the truth of the gospel. God sees who we really are. And I hope in some way that you look deeply into your own consciences to see us as well. But we hope you understand 
that we are not trying to prove ourselves to you or pull together a resume that will impress you. Right? We are simply hoping that you will find a sense of joy in connecting with us. And when you are approached by others who may value appearances more than the heart, asking questions about us, you will be able to offer an answer to them. You see, there are those outside of God as well as those as, that are inside of God who are always judging things according to outward. Well, in the beginning of the service, I was talking about living in the Spirit, remember? And I said, if you lived in the Spirit, it's all about what's inside. If you live in the flesh, it's all about the outward appearance. It's all about the outward stuff. So in the body of Christ, the divisions that take place within different denominations, or even some division that takes place that's total, all divisions are ungodly, by the way, you know, but things that are usually judged outwardly and not inwardly. People who get offended are never offended because the Holy Spirit said something to them. They're offended because somebody else said something to them. It could be a pastor, it could be you. It could be something that was said wrongly, the message right, but just delivered wrongly. And sometimes people get upset and people get offended and they receive it with the ears of the natural, with the mind and the soul of the natural, instead of receiving things in their spirit and hearing what the message of God is saying through it. Amen? We're not about division. We're not about outwardness. We're not about race. This is not the Italian Church of America, praise God. Right? As a church. We're a body where there's no male or female. There's no bond or free. There's no Jew or Greek. We're living in the spirit where the labels don't exist. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. There's either God's people or not. I thought I'd get a bigger amen, but okay. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't judge by the outward appearance. Verse 13, if we seem out of control or act like fanatics, turn to your neighbor, say out of control, act like fanatics. It's for God. Let me ask you a question. When is the last time you acted like a fanatic? When was the last time you got out of control? I'm talking about in God, not in your flesh. When was the last time you got so excited that your shoes fell off? When was the last time that you were so overwhelmed with the glory and the presence of God that you couldn't do anything but just stand there and cry with tears and snot? <laughs> When was the last time you led your whole office to Jesus? Your whole school to Jesus? Because that's what fanatics do. Fanatics go above and beyond the usual. I don't like the silence. When you get the revelation of understanding that the creator of all life lives in you. The creator of everything that has ever been created lives in you. Maybe you get a little fanatical. Maybe you'll jump for joy. Maybe you can't wait to tell everybody about it. Or maybe you could, I don't know. Amen? Again, if we seem out of control, act like fanatics, it's for God. But if we act in a coherent and a reasonable way, it's for you. You see, there's a time where we can rejoice before God corporately and the presence and the power and the glory of God hits and people just get drunk in the Holy Ghost, rolling on the floor, giggling and laughing, knocking the rose out of the place, and it's great. But then when it comes to ministering to people who maybe don't know too much or young in the Lord or maybe aren't saved yet, that stuff doesn't work because then they're going to haul you off to creed more, right? So then you need to speak to them coherently and intelligently and give them a presentation of the gospel. And when that doesn't seem to work, lay hands on them and watch God heal them. 
but it's got to be done in a non-crazy way. Amen? You got to be all things to all people. That doesn't mean if you're ministering to an alcoholic, you got to get drunk to minister to them. That's not what that means. If you're ministering to a hooker, that doesn't mean you have to sleep with her to minister the gospel. That's not what it's talking about. Some people take that scripture and take it to a really ungodly extremes, okay? We have to be able to relate. And they have to relate back. Being all things to all people. Amen? Man, we're not even done with the chapter? We still have another hour to go. Jeez. <clears throat> Verse 14, you see the controlling force in our lives. Say controlling force. Controlling force. Well, Pastor Vin, we're not supposed to be controlled by anything and anybody. The controlling force in our life is the love of the anointed one. And our God, I'm sorry, and our confession is this. One died for all, therefore all have died. He died for us so that we will all live. Not for ourselves. Ah. Uh, but for him who died and rose from the dead. Because of that, God, because of all that God has done, we are now have a new perspective. We used to show regard for people based on worldly standards and interests. No longer. We used to think of the anointed Jesus the same way. No longer. Therefore, if anyone is united with the anointed one Christ, that person is a new creation. The old life is gone. Hey, check yourself. Is your old life gone? Or do you still behave the same way you behaved before you got saved? Do you still lie? Do you still cheat? Do you still break the law willingly? Check yourself. Because along with salvation, there needs to be conversion. Or else salvation might not actually be salvation. Amen? Amen? Because salvation brings transformation through conversion where I am not what I used to be. I am that new creation in verse 17 we just read. Amen? We used to show regard for people based on worldly standards and interests no longer. We used to think of the anointed the same way. No longer, because now we don't know about him. We know him. Therefore, if anyone is united with the anointed one, that person is a new creation. The old life is gone. See, a new life has begun. All of this is a gift from our Creator God, who has pursued us and brought us into a restored and healthy relationship with Him through the anointed Jesus. And He has given us the same mission, the same mission of making it our point, making it our aim, making it our goal, making it our zeal, to show all people, same mission, the ministry of reconciliation. To bring others back to him. It is central to our good news that God was in the anointed making things right between himself and the world. This means he does not hold their sins against them. But it also means he charges us to proclaim the message that heals and restores our broken relationships with God and each other. Amen. Amen. The title of this message, by the way, is Agents of Restoration. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're an agent. Agent of Restoration. Amen? Verse 20. So we are now representatives of the Anointed One, the Liberating King, Jesus. God has given us a charge. Say charge. Not suggestion, but a charge. To carry through our lives, urging all people. Not just the cute ones. Not just the rich ones, not just the easy to get along ones, urging all people on behalf of the anointed to become reconciled to their creator God. He orchestrated this, the anointed one, who has never experienced sin. He became sin for us, that we might embody the very righteousness of God. Amen. 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 He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. Amen? While we were yet sinners, what did Christ die for? What did Christ do? He died for us. I gave it away. Right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Have you died for anybody? I'm not talking about physically. Because then you serve no purpose to nobody. Have you laid down your agendas? Have you laid down your schedule? Have you laid down your will to see somebody get saved? 
we are supposed to be reproducing the very thing that Jesus did to others. We are Christ-like. We are Christians. We follow the example of Jesus. What Jesus did, we do. If he laid down his life, we lay down our life. We lay down our wants. We lay down our desires. We lay down our riches and become poor. So those who are poor become rich. Amen? Do you like this teaching? Or do you want me to kiss you? We need to make it our goal. We need to make it our vision. We need to make it our aim. We need to make it our purpose that wherever we are, we are either leading people to Jesus or we're leading them to hell. There is no middle ground and there is no someone else will get to them someday mentality. Because the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Today. When are you supposed to bring... Today. Right now. Today's the day of salvation. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And also, don't let the sun go down without presenting the gospel to people. Does that mean you need to get on the radio and preach? Does that mean you've got to stand on your desk at work and say, Repent, you filthy sinners! No, it means you need to represent the gospel. And you need to do what Jesus did. Jesus wasn't religious and boring. Jesus wasn't just so full of tradition, he was useless. He was full of life. He attracted people to himself, right? He attracted sinners to himself, right? When the Pharisees wanted to stone the woman who was caught in adultery, remember? Remember, they caught her in the very act. What were Pharisees doing peeking in a window? (laughs) Just curious. They caught her in the very act. You see, Pharisees are always looking for fault. They found fault in Jesus who had none. Right? Right? This woman was caught in adultery. What did Jesus do? He condemned her too, right? No, he he offered a different perspective to things. He said, you who have no sin, throw the first stone. And there's a lot of speculation to that verse. You know, there's a lot of things that people read into it that doesn't actually say but could quite possibly say Jesus knelt down and started writing in the sand. Some people say he started writing all the people the Pharisees were committing adultery with. Or all the sins that they were committing. And they all dropped their rocks and walked away. Right? Some people say he drew the Christian fish symbol. Right now it, it doesn't really make a big difference. Because he said, he who has sinned, let them throw the first stone. You do understand Jesus had no sin and he had the right to throw the first stone. He was the only one there who could throw that first stone. But he didn't. And said he loved that woman. And he didn't get caught up in the gossip of putting her down. Didn't get in the gossip of everything else. Oh, that co-worker. Did you hear about that co-worker? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't get caught up in that stuff. He chose to love. Love. Exciting. and new, Right? He chose to love. Turn to your neighbor and say, sounds like you. Amen. So verse 18 to 21 in the New King James says, Now all things are God he has, who has reconciled us to himself. Say reconciled. 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 He has given us the ministry. Say ministry. ministry. Say reconciliation. reconciliation. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing a trespass to them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation, right? Now then, you are ambassadors for Christ. Say ambassador. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're an ambassador. You have an official title. As though God were pleading through us We are ambassadors as if God was pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. The word reconciled. The word in the Greek is katalasso. And figuratively it means to compound a difference. It means to change mutually. To change mutually. To change mutually. 
Jesus knew no sin, became sin because we were sin and we became righteous. There was a mutual change that took place. Holy became unholy, so unholy could become holy. Now, I'm not saying you have to become unholy to get people saved. Right? There was a mutual change. And that reconciled. That word in the Thais goes on to say, not only to change and exchange, but to reconcile those who are at variance. How many know what the word variance means? I didn't know. I had to look it up. It means those who are at difference, those who are at discrepancy, those who are dissimilarity, those in disagreement, and those who are in conflict. You see, everyone who is not saved is in disagreement with us. They are not similar to us. And we have to make a mutual change in reconciling them back to God because God says he's given us the ministry. Say ministry. He's given to you the ministry. In order to have a ministry, what do you have to be? A minister. In order to have a ministry, you need to be a minister. So we have the ministry of reconciliation or we are ministers of reconciliation. Amen? Ministry means attendance as a servant. You're a servant. I started out talking in the beginning that we are the servants of God. We are the ministers of God. The greatest in the kingdom is the Pope. No, the servant. God said the greatest in the kingdom is the servant. This word goes on to say, figuratively an aid, a Christian teacher, or technically someone of the deaconate. Turn to your neighbor and say, hello, deacon. Deacon. We think that deacon is a title. Right? And the Bible does talk about deacons, you know, setting deacons in their place and setting elders in their place. It's, it's in the word. But each and every one of us function as a deacon. The word deacon means a servant. Tom started out as a deacon. Is he a servant? Right? Whatever needs to get done, gets done. Don't even have to ask him to do stuff. He does stuff I didn't even ask him to do. Because it's on his heart as a servant. Right? And we are called to be servants. Not just servants in the house, but servants of reconciliation. Deacons of reconciliation. I'm going to get you all a deacon pin. We're all deacons. Hold on a second. Just ordained you all. Okay? Right? Deacons and ministers. Amen? And the thing is, it goes on to say this. Someone who's in service, ministry. Especially those who execute the commands of others. You're a servant of those who execute commands. What am I doing right now? Thank you, I'm ministering. I'm giving you commands. For the past three years, I've been executing commands. I've been building you up. I've ministered on evangelism. I've ministered on walking in the divine favor of God. I've ministered on the zeal and the passion of God, all for the purpose of what? Reaching people. Right? What was the purpose of the divine favor of God? So you can demonstrate the love of God, being part of the covenant of God and the Abrahamic covenant of being blessed to be a blessing, paying people's bills, paying for police officers' coffee, paying for someone's groceries at the, at the stop and shop. For the purpose of loving on people to demonstrate the love of God for those that maybe never experienced the love of God, right? Evangelism, I've ministered on this. These things are not because this is what a pastor's supposed to do. It's his job, after all, he's got to do something. I, all through the week, he plays with a paperclip. You know, he's got to do something on Sunday. We might as well listen to him do his one-hour job. No! It's to impart into you the power of God to be obedient to God's word. Right? So I issue commands. Right? So we being deacons almost have to be like genies. <laughs> almost like genies. How many of you live in a bottle? Rub the lamp. What happens? <sighs> Comes out. And what does he say? 
Why are you bothering me? It's Sunday. No, he says, your wish is my command. Right? Now, I'm not saying we have to be genies, okay? Look, don't be a genie. I'm just saying, we need to be looking for the opportunity to walk in obedience. Because if the word of God is spoken from God to your leadership, and God tells us what to minister to you, the purpose is it's not because that's their job. The purpose is, is God is trying to get a message to you personally and directly. And if he did not think you are capable of doing it, he would have told me to teach, upon, teach about angels. Right? Because God's not going to give the leaders a message to bring to the sheep that have nothing to do with the sheep. It is a now word for you to receive and act upon in obedience. Amen? Amen. So the Thayer says, service, ministering, especially to those who execute the commands of others, of those who by the command of God proclaim and promote God among men. Example, the office of Moses. B, the office of the apostles and its administration. C, the office of prophets, evangelists, elders, etc. So we see that our ministry is a calling just as if it was fivefold. Am I losing you guys? You guys thinking about the dinner? Okay. Ministers reconciliation. Say reconciliation. reconciliation. Goes back to that same word of exchange. But figuratively it means this. You ready? Ministers of reconciliation. That is the restoration to the... the, the no, da, 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 da. It sounds like I'm starting an old Buick. Da, 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 da. The restoration to the divine favor of God. You see, God has called us as ministers of reconciliation to restore those people who don't know the favor of God, don't know the grace of God, into the place of the divine favor of God. And what does the divine favor of God do for us? Oh, it does everything for us. You can't get saved without the favor of God, the grace of God. Amen? But you can't have healing or prosperity without it. You can't have someone pay off your mortgage without it. Amen? We need it, and God wants us to minister to God's people by faith, the pre-saved, the about to be saved, those who are on the cusp of being saved through you, so they can now receive the restoration that God has for their lives. Amen? Hallelujah. How many of you are here saved? Right? How many of you know that your pastors have a calling in their lives? Does Pastor Teresa have a calling? What's her calling? Anyone know? Don't say it, Rosie. What's Pastor Teresa's calling? I, I heard the A word, apostle and prophetess. Right? How many know my calling? Pastor, teacher. Right? But you all have been called out of darkness into light. Each and every one of us have a calling. Each and every one of us have a purpose of the reason God laid hold of us. Amen? God has called you. He has equipped you with many things in order to be a success in his kingdom. Amen? What has God equipped us with? Well, first of all, he has equipped us with his very self. Or would it be his very self? The Bible says that the fullness of the God... Say fullness... Fullness of the Godhead. What's the Godhead? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He has given it, and where is it? Dwelling in you. The fullness. You have 101% of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. The fullness, the richness, the magnificence of that God dwelling in you. You don't only have the Holy Spirit, you got the whole Godhead in there. Right? You have the word of God that brings us to the place of understanding. It brings us to the place of having greater faith. It get, brings us to the place of being empowered because the word of God empowers the grace of God that's in us. So we can do the will of God. So we got the word that produces faith and empowers the grace. We got the Godhead. What else do we have? We have each other who are supposed to constantly be praying for one another, edifying each other, encouraging each other, building each other up. You can do it, man. You can get the world saved. Matter of fact, I'm going to come with you. We're both going to get the world saved. Amen? 
Because that's the kind of enthusiasm we need to have. If we don't make it a goal, if we don't make it a point, if we don't make it a vision in our life to reproduce life after our own kind, guess what? The devil's going to distract you. He wants his kingdom full of worshipers. Hell. The only problem is, is they're not going to worship him. Dope. Amen? Amen. What else do you have? You have your leaders who live life as an example, who labor hard among you, right? Spend time ministering and praying for you, praying at the services, praying at Friday. Yeah, we we labor, we set the example, we live our lives in integrity. We, We come to the place of making sure we're here early, making sure we stay late, making sure that everyone who needs to speak to us speaks to us, ministering to people on the phone, ministering to people through text, ministering to people through email, ministering to people face-to-face, encouraging one another, building each other up, right? We have everything you need that pertains to life and godliness. There is no excuse why you don't walk in the calling that God has upon your life other than you will not to do it. Well, you know, I'm so busy. We live in New York. Everyone's busy. Even the homeless are busy. It takes a lot of work to be homeless in, the, in this state, in this city. Amen? Let's go back and finish what we started. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 to 21 says, You're now an ambassador for Christ. Say ambassador. As though God was pleading through us. An ambassador. How many know what an ambassador is? We talked about this a year ago. An ambassador is an official envoy, especially a diplomatic agent. Say agent. A diplomatic agent of the highest rank, accredited to a foreign government or sovereign, as a resident representative of his or her own government or sovereign, or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. When we have the UN here, so we have a lot of ambassadors that come here. We have a lot of diplomats. We have a lot of ambassadors that come here. When an ambassador comes to another nation, they live in an embassy, right? And that embassy, even though it might be in New York, doesn't belong to New York. It belongs to the country he's representative of. So if you go into the Canadian embassy, you've just entered Canada. Right? So a, 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 an ambassador represents his country, represents his nation in a foreign land. The Bible says that you are pilgrims. You're ambassadors. You're strangers in a strange land, and some of us are quite strange. Me first, right? So this is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. As much as on the outward we're Americans, the real you, the spirit you, is not going to die an American. The real you is going to die a child of God in heaven. Amen? You're not going to spend eternity in the United States. It would be nice. Heaven's nicer. Amen? Now, here's the thing. When an ambassador speaks, he speaks as if the king was speaking himself. So he is a direct representative of his king, his leader, his president, whoever is the ruler of that kingdom. He speaks as if the king was there himself. Right? Ambassadors. So ambassador is quite a high title for God to say we are. Quite a high title it's probably the closest title you're going to get to the king without being the actual king. And what the king says, the ambassador says. What the king does, the ambassador does. When an ambassador does something or says something that the king doesn't do or the king hasn't said, he he usurps the authority of the king. And you know what that's called? Treason. And you know what some people are end up happening when they do that? 
So we have the role of an ambassador. So without getting too political for a second, when our ambassador got killed in Libya, and our leaders say, what difference does it make? That leader has no clue what the role of an ambassador, because that was as if President Obama himself was killed. That's how it should have been treated. Now understand, as a Christian, that's the level God says you're at. He didn't say that's the level you will obtain. You are ambassadors of Christ. He didn't say one day you may grow into a full-grown person or Christian or ambassador. You are ambassadors. That's high rank and title, isn't it? I'm an ambassador. Say ambassador. God is good. Ambassadors of restoration. Agents of restoration. You want me to keep going? Yes, no? I can. Romans 5, 5 to 10 in the voice. We've gone over this. Romans chapter 5, verses 5 to 10. And it says, And hope will never fail to satisfy our deepest need because of the Holy Spirit who is given to us. He has flooded our hearts with God's love. Remember? Remember I gave the example of a flood? And if you're in a flood, no matter where you go, you're going to splash all over everything and everybody. Wherever you're going, the love of God is supposed to be splashing on everybody and everything around you because he's flooded your hearts with love. He didn't give you a drip. He didn't break out the eyedropper. He's given you the fullness of the Godhead and he's given you the fullness of his love to overflowing to the point that wherever you get around people, you have no choice but to get the love of God on them. It's the love of God that wins people to Christ. Now here we are, here's an example. Sonia, you're a filthy rotten sinner just for the moment. You're a terrible person, horrible. Oh, you beat your child every night. I knew that would get your attention, right? And so I'm over here, I'm just talking here, I'm running Dunkin' Donuts and I'm ordering my coffee and love is just splashing all over you. Not coffee, love. And then I do this, and walk away. I prepared her heart to receive because the power of love is already splashing upon her. What's in my heart is now starting to splash into her heart. She's already being prepared. She's already being prepared. Speak, ambassador, speak, speak. Nah, burn in hell. Well, we don't say it. I ain't got time for this, God. You're on eternity's clock. You're not on your own. I repent for calling you a filthy, rotten sinner. You are blessed and highly honored in God, and you only beat your child when necessary, (laughs) according to the scripture. I'm kidding. Amen? Shall we continue? When the time was right, the anointed one died for all of us who were far from God, powerless and weak. Now it is a rare find It is rare to find someone willing to die for an upright person, although it's possible that someone may give up his life for one who's truly good. But think about it. While we were wasting our lives in sin, God revealed his powerful love to us in a tangible display. The anointed one, Jesus, died for us. As a result, the blood of Jesus has made us right with God now, and certainly he will be rescued by him from God's wrath in the future. That means we're not going through the rapture. Um, We're going through the rapture. (laughs) I'm sorry. We'll be out of here for the rapture. We won't have to go through the great tribulation. I thought that was the trumpet blast. I was getting ready to go. Right? Verse 8, in the New King James says, God demonstrated his own love. Demonstrated his own love. Demonstrated his own love. So not only does the love of God that is flooding our heart get splashed on people, 
God says that we have to demonstrate that love. What does it mean to demonstrate something? Well, this time of year, if you go to malls, they got people demonstrating everything. Oh, try this new coffee machine. Ooh, espresso, so easy, push the button, you know. The word demonstrate means to show, to prove, to establish, and to exhibit. We show unto sinners, we prove unto sinners, we exhibit unto sinners what true love is. How? By dying for them. The Jubilee Bible. Anyone ever hear of the Jubilee Bible? You can only read it every 40 or 50 years. 50 years. No, I'm kidding. It says it this way. But God, check this out. God increased the price of his charity towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean? He increased the price. It means that he put such a higher value to it. God didn't demonstrate cheap love. The word says that we don't tell our brother that we love them when we see they're in need and just walk away. Oh, I'll I'll just pray for you. Yeah, yeah, I'll pray for you. We need to demonstrate the love of God. It needs to be exhibited. It needs to be demonstrated. It needs to be real. If it's in your power to meet somebody's need, meet the need, the Bible says. Amen? Hallelujah. In closing, you glad we got to those words? In closing, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. How many know it? It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power unto salvation. Right? I'm not ashamed. What does the word ashamed mean? Let's see, shall we? I thought I saved the word ashamed. Okay. We know what, the, what, what it means to be ashamed. It means embarrassed. It means you, you're put off by it. it. It means you don't want anybody to know. If I was ashamed of my daughter, right? How many know I have a daughter? If I was ashamed of my daughter, I wouldn't talk about her. I wouldn't show you a picture of her. Right? I wouldn't invite her to be here. No, she, does, she goes to her own church. So, right? I would hide her. We are not to hide the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation, whoever believes it. But the Bible says, how will they believe it if there's no preacher? How will they hear it if there's no minister? How will they hear it if you don't tell them? The love of God prepares them, just like the love of God prepared us to get saved. The love of God that's in your heart prepares them. Demonstrating the love. Showing forth what it means to deny yourself. Pick up the cross. Follow Jesus' example and love others. Right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power. Say power. What's the word power here? Dunamis. Miracle worker. The working of miracles. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's, the, it's about to do the miracle of saving someone, bringing them out of darkness into light. I'm not ashamed. I'm looking for the opportunity to do so. How many of you know what the Great Commission is? Mark 16, 15. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. You don't have to go to all nations to teach them. All nations are right here. Go forth and make disciples of all men. All men and women and children and dogs. Or maybe not the dogs, okay? Now the word commission is a military term. Just like the word go is a military command. Jesus is the captain of the hosts. That doesn't mean he's the head of the ushers. It's a military term. He's a warrior. He's our commander in chief. It's not the great suggestion. It's the great commission. There are different type of offices in the military. There are commissioned officers and non-commissioned officers. What's the difference? One has backing. One has documentation and paper 
They have black ink on white paper that states an official document stating they are commissioned by the United States of America. We have our commissioning right here. We've been commissioned to a position. Military terminology, commission. When they build a new ship, they commission that ship when they launch it. Sometimes they'll christen it with a bottle, you know, break the champagne on it, but that's not the point. It is officially called into service. God has officially called each and every one of us into his army of love to go forth and bringing reconciliation, bringing favor, bringing restoration to those who need to be restored back to their creator. You could do it. We have all the reasons why we should do it. We have to start doing it. And here's the secret. Who's the youngest one in the room? Ray, oh, he's sleeping. <laughs> okay. Do we have anyone under 10 here? No. Anyone under 15? I mean in the room, under 15? Anyone under 18? Anyone under 17? So you are the, typically the youngest one in the room besides sleeping John. <laughs> right? Which means you have the ability of bringing salvation to every young person in your age class. Who's in their 20s? Raise your hand if you're in your 20s. 20s? 20s? No, I'm lying. I'm not in my 20s. Yeah, Leo. <laughs> Divided by four. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. 20s? Who else is 20? 20, 20, 20, 20, right? You have the ability to reach everyone who's in their 20s and bring them into the kingdom of God. Who's in their 30s? 30s. We have a 30. Anyone else in the 30? Yes, 30s. We have the ability to bring in that whole demographic. 40s, anyone in the 40s? Anthony, 40s, 40s, 40s. Okay. We have the ability. 40 plus? <laughs> 50s? Anyone in their 50s? 50s? 60s? People in the 60s? 70s? People in their 70s? 80s? The people in their 80s? 90s? See, we haven't arrived yet. Please understand that if you're in your 80s, your anointing is no different than this one who's 17. Your calling is no different than the one who's 17. <coughs> and everyone in between have the same anointing, have the same gifting, have the same calling, have the same commissioning. The methodology might be different, right? But you have still been called. One Bible word you're not going to find. You know what that Bible word is that you're not going to find? Retirement. The word retire is not in the Bible. You work for the kingdom until you drop or until he... Right. Amen? Amen? I was talking about my benefits as a pastor to someone. And they say, so what kind of retirement plan do they offer? I said, I get to go to heaven. <laughs> That's it. No 401k? Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> My retirement plan is when I'm out of here, Jack, or Jill, and that should be our retirement plan is too. But my goal is, my aim is to see each and every one of you flourishing. Amen. Amen. And as we come into this new year, we're going to make some changes. We're going to change our attitude. We're going to change our, maybe even our schedule but we're going to do some things differently. Einstein was a pretty smart guy, right? Maybe a little crazy, right? But you know what? Most smart people are a little crazy. Just a little bit. A little bit. He described insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So we as people, you in your lives, need to start doing things differently. And I'm going to put out the charge. And I'm going to put out the command. And we have to obey, just like I have to obey. And just like Pastor Teresa and Nada and Rosie, and we all have to come into this place of great obedience to God. Amen? 
Are you willing? It's a matter of our will. That's what it comes down to. A matter, oops, of our will. Amen. God's looking for the willing. Ready, willing, and able. Let's do it. Okay? Thank you for bearing with me. Give the Lord a praise. Honor the King. Give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. If you're watching by way of Ustream, thank you for bearing with me. If you watch the whole thing to the end or you fast forwarded it to the end, it's okay. I still love you. I got good news for you. Jesus Christ is Lord. And he died for you. He brought us to a place of having entrance into the kingdom of God, but also being able to walk in the God-given authority that God has given us. He said all authority has been given to us. So we have the authority of God to walk in the will of God. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I have good news for you. Man, he loves you more than you will ever know in your lifetime. When you get to heaven, you'll have all eternity to figure it out, right? His love is so much greater than we even experience here in the natural. But his love is so great that he was willing to leave heaven and live this life like man and willing to pay the penalty of a criminal's death by being nailed to the cross. And the Bible says on that cross, he became sin. He didn't just take the sin on himself. He actually became sin. That's why the father couldn't look at him. That's why the the sky got dark and the earth quaked and the veil ripped, you know? Because what was holy in God's sight now became every filthy sin. And guess what? In God's sight, every sin is filthy. There's not one sin that's worse than others. Sin is sin is sin. But he did it so we can receive forgiveness. And most important, have a relationship restored. Man, having a relationship with God is the greatest relationship you could ever have in your life. Because not only will it bring you healing and restoration, not only will it bring you peace, but you get to be reunited with your creator here on earth. Hearing his voice, the Bible says, my sheep know my voice and a stranger's voice they no longer follow. Hearing the voice of God speak to you has got to be one of the most amazing things. But it's not an impossible thing. It should be the ordinary for those who accept Christ. Amen. Those that are led by his spirit are led by his voice. If you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you're willing to do so, pray with me this prayer. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you died for me personally that you took my sin and became sin for me so I might become the righteousness of Christ. Right now, I thank you for forgiving my sin. I accept your love and invite your spirit into my heart. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your power. Give me a hunger to know you. Give me a passion for you. Make me your child. Speak to me in Jesus' name. I thank you for saving me, healing me, delivering me, and prospering me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. God bless you all. There's a number on the screen. If you prayed that prayer, give me a call. I'd love to speak with you. If you have a Bible, great. If you need a Bible, I'd be more than happy to send you one for free. No scams, no bombardments of letters looking for money. Not about that. I'm about you coming to the place of knowing God personally. Thank you for viewing. God bless you all. See you next week. Amen.